We are continuing on in our series on the Psalms. Of course, the longest book, largest book in the Bible being the book of Psalms. It is a compilation of many different songs, these uh, poetry, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew poetry. Many of these, at least half of them, um, around half of them written by King David. And we are looking not at every single song or every single psalm uh, in this book, but we are highlighting several of the different psalms. And last week we looked at King David's psalm, Psalm 22, and it was a messianic psalm, prophecy of Jesus Christ. He starts out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And now that's contrasted this week with Psalm 23, another one of King David's psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so uh, we will be looking at this psalm in a little more detail today as we look, um, uh, continue on in this series. Psalm 23. In this psalm, we will see David, who once was a shepherd, now considering himself as a sheep, as a lamb, and the Lord being his shepherd. And as we look at this, we see that he shows how trustworthy Jehovah, our Lord, is. And we see in ourselves that when we trust in ourselves or try to do things ourselves, we cannot complete it as we should. And we find ourselves worrying and frustrated and fearful and anxious. And instead, we need to trust Jehovah completely. And since he is our shepherd, the great shepherd, we need to trust him in every situation, in everything we do. So as we look at this psalm, we'll be seeing those points today. Now, I remember quite a few years ago, uh, as I call it, B.C., before children, uh, Jill and I were married, and we were sitting on a worn but comfortable couch as Jennifer, a spunky little six-year-old girl, and her brother, Roberto, ran around in the little bit of space that there was in their trailer, while the adult, other adults in the room were carrying on a very, very serious conversation with their parents. We had come with two members uh, from our church, a Spanish-speaking church plant we were involved with, Iglesia Bautista Maranata in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we had come to visit Lorena, Jennifer and Roberto's mom. From a human point of view, you could say that their mother, uh, Lorena, and her husband, Renee, had fallen on hard times, very difficult times. They were new immigrants to America, and Lorena had recently found out that she had cancer, I believe it was leukemia, and she was undergoing chemotherapy. Her husband seemed exhausted, but continued pushing himself to work long hours, usually seven days a week, because he knew that the cold season was coming and he wouldn't have work through the winter. The other two members that were of our church that were with us were talking to Lorena and Renee about salvation, about getting saved, about converting uh, to having a, a true relationship with God. And although I could tell they wanted to be nice to us, I could also tell that uh, Lorena and Renee weren't really interested in converting or changing from their Roman Catholic traditions. I prayed and asked the Lord to help me in this situation since I didn't know what to do and I didn't even know Lorena very well and I felt so bad for them. The Lord brought this passage, Psalm 23, to mind. And since then, I have often used this, and many times I've read this in hospital rooms and even at, at grave sites. And uh, I, I asked them, I said, you know, could I, uh, could I read a psalm to you? And uh, they said that would be fine. I told them I would read Psalm 23, and they seemed glad to hear it, and they seemed very familiar with it. And so as I began to read, Jehovah es mi pastor, nada me faltará, I could see almost a relaxing in their faces. And as I finished reading this Psalm 23 in Spanish, I, I told them that David, the one who wrote this, was able to sing this psalm of comfort and encouragement because of his relationship with the Great Shepherd. I explained that we all have hardships and pains because of this sinful world. We have anxieties and worries in our life. I then explained that because Jehovah, the Lord, is our shepherd, we must trust him in all situations. And this started with having a personal relationship with them, the Lord, I explained. Now, neither Lorena nor Renee, her husband, were ready to accept the Lord right then, but they told me that they were interested in hearing more another time. As we look today at this beautiful passage, the most well-known passage, I believe, of all the Old Testament, many people have memorized this psalm, we will see how David's song of contentment in Jehovah is still true some 3,000 years after it was penned. 
We will see Jehovah as our shepherd, an image that is shown throughout the Old and the New Testament. And as our shepherd, we're going to focus on two things that the Lord is for us. As our shepherd, the Lord is our guide, and as our shepherd, the Lord is our provider. I had uh, been living in Guatemala, studying Spanish and working with a uh, Guatemalan children's ministry. Um, I had been there already, I guess, maybe three months, and I was still mesmerized by the incredible scenery in Central America. I had spent the majority of my time studying and working in the area around Antigua, Guatemala, uh, which is known for uh, unique volcano mountains. Wanting to get up close to a volcano, uh, knowing that I was towards the end of my time there, a friend of mine uh, who was rooming at the same house I was encouraged me to sign up to take a tour of a live volcano not far from where we were living. I believe the name was Bacaya. When we arrived at our destination, I had kind of glanced at the instructions that the guide had given us, but I hadn't really read them closely. Uh, but our guide came up, and he introduced himself, and he was talking to us, and I noticed that he had a, a jacket on, maybe more of a coat, and I looked around me at different people from other countries, including my friend who was from Germany, and they all were packed with, with jackets, like they were ready for cold weather, and um, I couldn't help but kind of chuckle to myself as I looked at these tourists and the guide, thinking they were foolish for wearing such hot clothing. It was hot and warm weather there in, in Guatemala, near uh, the forest and things. It was actually very hot and humid. And of all things, we were hiking a live volcano, so I thought it must get hotter. Um, so every time that we as a group would take a break, I tried to push ahead a little bit. I wanted to get away from the crowd and kind of get in the front. And uh, eventually, we pushed our way through a windy trail in the woods. We finally reached what I thought maybe was the top of the mountain or close to it as uh, the trees kind of gave away and, and I uh, saw a slope in an open area and I kind of ran out into this open area and then I looked up. And there, after all of that hiking, I realized that now we were just now getting to the bottom of the volcano and the path seemed to go straight up. When our guide got closer, he pointed out that the little specks we could see at the top of the mountain or the volcano, those little specks were actually people. The guide told us we should take a rest while it was easy, and uh, before we got going up the volcano, I decided I wanted to stay in the head of the, head of the group, so I decided instead of resting, I would you know, start running and, and get up that volcano sooner than anybody else. Um, as I mustered up my energy and began going up the hill, uh, it took me a while. It was very difficult and quite long getting up to the top of that volcano mountain. When I reached the top, I could feel myself shaking, and then I heard this chattering sound and realized it was my teeth. Oddly enough, at the top of this smoking volcano, it was cold. In fact, it felt maybe freezing cold and very windy, and the wind made it feel even colder. I sat down and waited for the guide and others to get there. As I rested, I remember trying to dig my arms into uh, the volcano soil there where it was warmer. To my chagrin, uh, I had used up all of my energy getting up the hill. Now I felt frozen and exhausted. It was going to be dark soon, and the guide warned us that we would have to hurry to get down the mountain in time. Um... He also told us that it would not take as long to go down the mountain as going up, but he said it would be much harder, though, because now all the weight would be on our legs and on our knees. My legs now felt like jello, and unfortunately for me, I had not listened to my guide, I had not read the instructions, and now I would pay the consequences. The way back, which should have been a wonderful chance to see the sunset behind the mountains and watch lava trickling down from some of the nearby volcanoes, became torturous, and I had to force myself to move my legs each step, forcing myself to take another step, to move one step further down the path that we had just climbed. When I finally got back to the house at the end of the day, I went straight to bed and I felt sore for several days thereafter. I learned the hard way that it pays to trust your guide. And you and I must trust the ultimate guide, the shepherd, our shepherd. The guide is our great shepherd, Jehovah, and the problems that we face in our life come as a lack of trust in him. Let's look at these first four verses that describe our guide. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. 
He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. As we see our great shepherd, Jehovah the Lord, uh, as our shepherd, we see that we must trust him as our guide in every situation. In these first four verses, we see this. We see that as our guide, he knows all of our needs. David now comparing himself as a sheep instead of the shepherd, knowing that sheep are not wild animals. They don't survive on their own. They must be protected. They must be provided for by their guide, by their shepherd. He says that that is what the Lord is to him. And just as the shepherd knows all the needs of his sheep, so the Lord knows all of our needs. He says that he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Uh, he, he knows when we need to lie down, even when we don't know it. As our guide, he knows all of our needs. As our guide, the great shepherd also leads us and directs us. He leads us beside still waters. Uh, he tells us what to do. And he takes us sometimes to pleasant places like the still waters and uh, the pasture lands. And sometimes he leads us through unpleasant places like in verse 4, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But all of these things he does as he is in control, knowing what we need. Uh, Philip, I believe it was Philip Keller who wrote a book on uh, Psalm 23 from a pa- uh, shepherd's point of view. And he talked about uh, the needs of sheep before they will lie down. Uh, there must not be any quarreling, any infighting among the sheep. They're a very social animal. And they need to have food and water, and they need to feel protected, and they need to be clean uh, before they will lie down in their pasture. And the Lord does this, knowing our needs, he directs us accordingly. Um, As our shepherd, though, he also protects us. He doesn't just lead us, but he protects us. Look at verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me, and what comforts me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. These may be describing the shepherd's hook, or it might be describing two different rods. Um, the large rod that was used for walking and leading and directing and guiding, as well as a smaller um, rod that was used to hit uh, wild animals that maybe were attacking the sheep. And so as our guide, he protects us. Uh, his protection never abandons us when we're facing scary trials. In fact, you see here that he helps us through the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, it is the low land. It is the lowest point in our life when we are in the valley of the shadow of death. Those points are the lowest times. But it is not death. In fact, even as a Christian, there's a, there's a hymn that reminds me. It says, it is not death to die. As a Christian, we do not die. We live eternally. And so when we face even physical death, it is only a shadow of death. It is not real death. And the Lord takes us through these hardest times, even our physical death, because we know, as the psalmist says at the end of this verse, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We know that. And so as he takes us through this place, we are reminded that this is only a shadow of death. And we also know that for in order for there to be shadows, I remember my dad used to do shadow puppets with us at night before kissing us uh, goodnight and tucking us in bed. He would bring a candle or some kind of a light, usually it was a candle on a candlestick, that he would use, and that light would cast a shadow on the wall. And so even when we're walking through the hardest times, we realize that death is not real for us as Christians. It is but a shadow, and it is God's light that we are looking to, because there must be light in order for there to be a shadow. And so we look to the Lord, our shepherd, and he protects us. His protection brings comfort no matter what thing or what matter, no matter what person is causing us to worry. There's not one thing that we face, but that his comfort cannot take us through. So we have seen here that rather than worrying, we must trust our shepherd as our guide. But now we are going to see that that instead of trusting ourselves and having anxieties, we need to see that the shepherd, our great shepherd, the Lord, provides for us. Look now, uh, starting in verse 5. Thou, the great shepherd, he's talking to him personally here, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, Now as we look at this, we see 
the Lord as our provider. In this slide, you can see a picture of some men I worked with in Guatemala. We were building houses for people, and we were on site there. Uh, the little buildings you see there were actually where the people and their animals were living. We were building, providing, making provisions for them. So I put that picture on there. Uh, but I want to tell you a story of what, another uh, time when I was traveling abroad. I was actually for a preaching campaign that I was uh, on with my father. And we were in Romania. And as we were in Romania, we had neat opportunities to interact with the people there, especially some of the children. And the church group that we were working with and having preaching campaigns with, they had uh, not only many churches, but many orphanages in this country uh, of Eastern Europe. And I remember going and visiting these orphanages and playing you know, soccer with the children and getting out there. And as we were headed to some of these orphanages, um, we we noticed that under some of the bridges and even in tunnels of the sewer system around these orphanages, sometimes very close by the orphanage, uh, there were little children. And my heart went out to them every time I saw them. And I was so glad that our friends had started orphanages to help them. But I couldn't help but notice how near they were sometimes to where the orphanage was. And so when we arrived at one of the orphanages where I'd just seen these children, some of them begging for money, some of them maybe trying to steal things, I, I wondered to them, I said, you know, why did they have these children living in such pitiful conditions so near? Was there not enough room in the orphanage? Uh, did the children not know about the orphanage? And they said, no. These children, there was room for them, and they knew about their orphanage. In fact, they pointed out that uh, the group of children I had just seen was a group of siblings, and that uh, when one of them, I think the little sister, had broken her leg, they had come to the orphanage and, and allowed them to give medical attention and were fed and clothed. And as soon as they felt like she was healthy enough for them to survive on their own, they left the provisions of in the comfort of the orphanage to go live on the street. They wanted to choose their own liberty, independence, to live they wanted the way they wanted, which was a horrible way of living rather than being provided for by these Christians in the orphanage. And I saw something recently on the news where they were going around handing out warm blankets and tents to people that were homeless this time of year. And again, the question, why don't they go to the homeless shelters? And these people had chosen rather to, than to be provided for to try to have to do it on their own and uh, to, to be fiercely independent. And this is um, a sad thing to see. Because we sometimes do the same thing to Jehovah. He is providing for us. He is our shepherd. And he offers us provisions, his providence. And we sometimes turn away from him. We oftentimes turn away from him. From him. What a difference it makes to have someone providing for you. These poor little disheveled faces and, and disheveled appearances of these little children in Romania. Uh, that look so sad and so hardened in contrast to the warm and, and happy faces of those who trusted the provision of the Christians in the orphanages. Because Jehovah is the great shepherd, you and I must trust him as our great provider in every situation. As our provider, we see in these verses that he provides for every need in every situation. He gives us this table before us. Even in the presence of our enemies, he's providing for us and meeting our needs as Jesus prayed in his prayer to his, uh, showing his disciples how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. And so we see his regular and constant provision because he knows what we need. We see that his providence, what he provides for us, is, with, is everlasting. It is eternal. He provides every day what we need, but he provides eternally in an eternal dwelling place. In fact, we see that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then we see that his providence will not fail. It will not leave us. He is eternally secure. His protection is eternally secure. Even in the presence of our enemies, no matter what happens, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life here on earth and eternally even we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So today I hope that as we look at this passage, it is so well known to you that you won't just skip over it, but that you will see the truth of who our shepherd is, that he has become our guide. Even Jesus Christ, our, our Lord, being our shepherd, he is our guide because we have the whole New Testament to look forward to, to look at him and see what he has done for us. As David was looking forward to it, we see it now in completion. And Jesus said that this new covenant, the New Testament, is represented by the cup. Uh, this is my blood, which was shed for you. This cup is the New Testament. And so we see through his 
pain and suffering he provided for us. He guides us and provides for us eternally that we might be saved from our sin and find his grace if we put our faith in him. One week after having visited Lorena, uh, the young lady who was dying of cancer, this young mother, I was in our church. If I remember correctly, I was leading the worship and Jill was playing the piano. And I saw this family come in. It was Lorena and Renee, their children. And uh, they, they came in and they listened. And as the pastor preached that day, they listened very, very closely to the message. And he gave an invitation to come forward and accept Christ as Savior. And here, after having thought about this, after having thought about this decision for quite a bit of time now, they decided that they would accept Christ as Savior, and they came forward and were gloriously and wondrously saved. And Lorena did walk through the shadow of the, the valley of the shadow of death, and she did pass from this life into the next uh, from her cancer. But the Lord, her shepherd, guided and protected her uh, through it. And so we can thank the Lord. Uh, for that. But we also, we are all dying, whether or not you have a terminal illness, we are all terminal the moment that we're born. And it's important to see how helpless we are that we need a shepherd. We need the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the Lord, who is all powerful and all wise. And if you've never accepted him as your savior, you need to do that. So, you need to do so today. If you have accepted him, are you looking to his word for direction in life? Are you looking to him to follow in the paths of righteousness for his namesake, I encourage you right now to make that decision today if you haven't already.